So what is your earliest memory? Uh, I think from age three. Uh, I had a bad, very bad uh, uh, infection of the double, uh, both my ears and uh, must, uh, must must this right? And was operated on. Uh, at that time, uh, the chloroform was the way of putting somebody uh, asleep. Uh, and uh, then I developed a meningitis. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I remember the hospital, the clinic, and I remember my mother coming in, and and of course I remember the operation, that is the falling asleep with this uh, kind of uh, lights overhead. So this, I think, are my earliest memories, as far as I can tell. Uh, today I don't remember anything before that, and I know that this took place in 35, so I was uh, a two and a half or three uh, on my way to being three. How would you describe your parents, if you have to? Uh, both were distant, uh, both were distant. My mother uh, uh, was a, uh, you see, you ask me about the Prague period or the f the, the ne ah so I have to be careful and what I what I said both were distant is about Prague. My father was a very shy and retiring person and mostly either played the piano, or read. He had a wonderful collection of books. He was a bibliophile. And um, so he sat in his study, or what I remember as his study, and um, the only time uh, that he really hugged me and kissed me was the last time I saw him, and that was in the hospital where he was, where they were both hiding in France in um, September, September, yeah. Uh, of uh, 1942. But in Prague, my father was, uh, I don't remember very much any scenes of uh, togetherness. My mother uh, was a much more um, a, a people's person, I would say. She really uh, was very energetic, uh, um, I'm sure very loving, but she had so many things to do that ultimately I was left a lot with my nanny in Prague, uh, which was a central person in my, in my life. It all changed, of course, when we left Prague in 39 and, uh, and arrived in France. Then we were the three of us. Uh, but I was again sent uh, from children's home to children's home because my parents had to had to learn, a, 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 had to completely reorganize their lives, also materially. We had no money, and we had no money transferred. I don't know how that came exactly, but that was the fact. And my father tried all kinds of... Uh, he, he learned French very well, and uh, my mother learned to be a beautician. Uh, yeah. Previous to that, still in Prague, the family was well to do was uh, well to do well to do i don't know if very well to do if it was the upper bourgeoisie or the middle bourgeoisie going up but uh, my father had a high position in a german or german speaking insurance company he was a lawyer by training I, 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 he had his uh, studied law. Uh, I don't think he ever practiced. He went into uh, business law, let us say. Uh, my mother's family, which came from the Sudetenland, uh, was, um, uh, they were industrialists, uh, uh, textile industry uh, in, in the family, and uh, in Rochlitz, where we lived, uh, Rokitnitz in Czech, uh, I lived there in the mountains, right, in the Sudeten mountains. Uh, 
we had a small textile factory. An uncle had a huge textile factory, but that was a different branch of the family. So all in all, we had a second home. Well, we had Prague, a very nice apartment on the top of a, of a building facing the, the castle. We had then uh, a, a house in, in a village near Prague, and we had, of course, this house in the Sudetenland. So we were well off. All that disappeared, <laughs> disappeared. Uh, my father, I think, trusted, as far as I remember the stories, told by my uncles who uh, emigrated to Sweden or to Palestine. So they told me a little bit about it. My father trusted a lot of the money to two friends who went to the States, to, to America, and then uh, the money disappeared. They never, uh, as far as I know, they never got in touch then with uh, my parents. So that we came to France relatively poor and became very poor. And uh, when we moved from Paris to the to Neri les bains where we lived then, uh, after the German occupation of France, uh, of northern France, we lived in the zone, uh, zone libre, so-called, but uh, in the non-occupied zone uh, until it was occupied in November 42, but then we were all already dispersed. Uh, there we, my mother went, uh, not only worked as a beautician that is with the ladies of that little town, but uh, made also cleaned houses. I often went with her when I was not at school. Cleaned, a cleaning, uh, la cleaning uh, lady. My father was ill also, uh, quite worse and worse, uh, ulcer of the stomach, couldn't be, had no medicine uh, available, um, uh, he gave finally, he, uh, the, what he did was teaching German, which was certainly the most ironic okay. uh, aspect of this part of our lives. So we were, I don't remember ever going, uh, uh, suffering from hunger at that time. I did later on but at that time, but uh, that was probably, I was, uh, I was given whatever uh, I needed, uh, but uh, I don't know how they managed. Uh, we were in a very bad situation. Let's go back a little to Prague. Do you have memories of, you were seven in 1939, of that atmosphere? there at that time? Oh, yes, very, very clear memories. You see, uh, I also have a almost auditive memory of Hitler's speech of September 38, just before, uh, uh, actually, a few, two weeks before Munich, before the Munich Agreement, when he threatened Banish and the Czechs, and he, uh, the speech I cannot now replicate, but gestern war es hundert, waren es hunderttausend, dann hundertzwanzigtausend, und dann zweihunderttausend. I heard the speech on the radio with everybody listening, and I remember the thousand and thousand and thousand in his shrieking voice. So um, that was the beginning. I was to go to school on that uh, autumn of 1938. Uh, and um, I was then, I turned six, October 38, and um, I went to an English school, uh, that is where the, 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 the taught English, the idea being, of course, we will have to emigrate very soon, and therefore uh, English, w Czech wouldn't help, and German uh, would be problematic in France or in England or wherever. And so uh, I, I started learning English. That was my 
uh, if I may say, my first school language. I don't that I learned much, but uh, I remain on. And I went to school with a kind of box, as every other child, round box where you had a gas mask. Uh, so I started school with a kind of uh, box on the side uh, with a gas mask, the idea being that uh, if the Germans attacked, uh, there would be a gas sprayed all over. Uh, well, uh, it, it, as you know, events turned out differently, uh, but all that left extremely vivid uh, memories in my mind, and then the trip through Germany to France and so on. That, uh, that's when the Germans invaded, your parents fled with you. How did uh, how did you get away? Well, we fled first by car. Uh, we had a car, which shows also, you know, um, and we tried to flee to Brno and then to the Hungarian, uh, that is Moravia, and then the Hungarian border. Uh, but the Germans were already there. So when we arrived at the border, I remember that also, I mean, there were German soldiers standing there. So we went back to Prague. And uh, how my parents, my father did it, I don't know, but he probably paid a, whatever was needed, considerable sum at that time for any Jew uh, trying to leave uh, for a visa to France, got a French visa. Uh, and uh, in April 39, we then left by train via Germany uh, to France and arrived in Paris. First Strasbourg, where I saw the first French soldiers uh, with the kepi and the beret basque and so on, and then uh, Paris. And when did you leave Paris for, for Vichy, France? Uh, in June of, 40, of June of 1940, when the, uh, just ahead of the Germans, who entered Paris, if my memory is correct now, on the 14th of June or the 13th, 14th of June. And we therefore must have left, uh, I left together with my mother. How we got on train, I don't know, but the train was uh, packed from all sides of people. And, and um, then my father followed two, three days later. How he got on the train, I don't know either. It was impossible to get on trains, so packed they were, but we, we got on train to uh, what was not yet Vichy. The Germans were <laughs> advancing. It was the, the war ended, you know, officially on the 25th of June. So by the, I guess, the 10th or something, we were already in neri les -Bains, small spa uh, town, and um, uh, my father it came along uh, a few days later. Do you, apart from all the bad memories, also have any good memories from, from the period of Neri at last pa oh, period yes. with your parents? Oh, yes. Uh, first, you know, <laughs> uh, it is related to the Prague or to the, to the Czech period where I was, uh, I mean, my parents, uh, I was an only child and uh, I was certainly pampered and everything, but not, we were not, you know, the kind of uh, uh, loving family uh, that, as I said, there was no intense togetherness that a child, of course, needs. Uh, it was very different in Neri. We, <laughs> had we wanted it or not, we were one on the other, really, because there were two, we lived in two small rooms uh, and a small kitchenette that was not a kitchen, a small kitchenette. And so I slept in one room with my father, and my mother slept in what was the living room, actually, if you wish. We, my father and I slept in the bedroom, and, um, and uh, so we spent a lot of time together, and I rem rem uh, there were moments of, yeah, of uh, great uh, warmth, of 
love. I mean, I used to go with my father uh, to buy milk by uh, peasants uh, as long as this was possible. Or we went to, uh, to look for um, champignons. Uh, how do you say? Mm. Mushrooms. Mushrooms, <laughs> sometimes. Words uh, go, that's age, you see. Um, for mushrooms, uh, or we, um, uh, we, I went with my mother to, to find, um, now that I do not know, uh, pissenlit is a strange French uh, word for a, for a kind of greenish uh, uh, leaf which grows on very, on the soil really, in, in the fields and that you could do good salad with it. It's ed edible. Edible, yes, for salad. And so, and she had a little garden that is, she had a piece of land uh, as small as half this room, and there she grew potatoes and so. So I spent a lot of time with her, either watching her when she did her beautician's work or going with her when she did clean the homes or going with her to, to work the garden. And so this all remains, I remember also sitting with her and watching the rain, um, uh, just so, and talking about whatever. Actually, uh, I remember about what we talked even. And um, uh, these were moments of, of happiness uh, for a child. Uh, I was aware that we were in a terrible situation, but uh, of course I didn't know. Then there was this moment uh, which was totally special, and that was this e evening of Hanukkah, uh, of the Jewish, uh, um, the Jewish, uh, a, a, a festival of lights uh, that is uh, the, the Jewish uh, holiday um, uh, commemorating uh, the liberation of the temple after, uh, uh, by the Maccabees where the light had, uh, had remained uh, a light for a week uh, I mean, uh, the, um, uh, this legend uh, which certainly uh, impressed uh, a child. I didn't know much about Jewish uh, holidays or anything. We were totally irreligious. But this moment of Hanukkah 1941, 1941, so it must have been uh, November, December, 1941, early December, let's say, uh, the war in Russia was already on and uh, things were getting darker and darker. And there we went to our friends, the Frankels. Uh, he was an Austrian Jew. Uh, his wife was not Jewish. And they had a little boy um, slightly younger than me, Jojo, uh, and uh, a playmate. And we ate uh, I think latkes, that's what is eating, eaten on Hanukkah. And uh, my father took me on his, uh, 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 on his knees and told me the story of Hanukkah, which I had never heard of. And that, uh, I described that. Uh, and I, um, I remember this as one of the most poignant moments of my early life. I was nine then. Um, and then maybe the thing I, uh, which remained the most uh, in, uh, in, in, how can I say, the deepest uh, memory I have of that period is of course the end of that period. And that um, uh, where also um, 
it's linked to to really to, to love and and suffering to a degree which uh, a child can bear, but barely, if I may uh, put it that way. Uh, I had been first sent to a when the the deportation started from Vichy, France. As you know, foreign Jews were deported uh, from Vichy, France, um, in uh, the summer of '42. After the Jews, foreign Jews had been deported from Paris. Those were caught to Drancy, as there were not enough uh, in the, um, uh, according to Eichmann's plans, of filling the trains. Uh, the foreign Jews of the Vichy zone. Uh, were deported uh, with the help of the French police. Uh, actually, it was only French police. And uh, my parents were panicky, so they sent me to a children's home, uh, La Souterraine, uh, a home f of, uh, uh, under the, the uh, 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 which was kept by the OSE, o -S -E, uh, Organisation de Secours à l'Enfance. And um, there were children, Polish, Jewish. Uh, I don't think there were French children, but uh, my age and a little bit older than me, and of course smaller. And um, I, I arrived there, I know exactly when, on August 8, 1942, uh, because I have a letter uh, where my father mentions uh, my having been sent there on that date. And um, it was a wonderful summer day, and there was a big sports, uh, sport events, you know, running and jumping and swimming. I was just, I arrived. I was, by the way, taken there by the director of my uh, école primaire, uh, grade school, because my parents couldn't travel and take me to, uh, it was a trip by train and bus, and uh, they couldn't, uh, they would have been caught. Mm. Um, so there I was, and uh, it looked wonderful. We sang uh, in the evening, there were songs and so, and I wasn't sad, I didn't know that, what would happen. And um, during that same night, towards uh, about three o'clock in the morning, were woken up by a terrible noise, and uh, these were the engines of, of trucks running, and we were all assembled on the, uh, on, a kind, on the first floor where we slept. There were tens of kids. I mean, I don't know how many, but tens. And every old children above the age of 10 uh, Ten or more were taken, and uh, I was, uh, I'm from October, so in August, of course, I was on my way to ten, but not yet age ten, so I remained, and uh, with others, the smaller ones, and I don't know if they were sent directly to Drancy or where these kids were sent, but uh, probably part of them perished, and uh, if not all of them. And then we, uh, the, the police apparently, that was the French police with the trucks, uh, French gendarmerie. And then one of, I, I, I suppose, or I think I know, uh, that somebody, uh, the commander said, you, uh, we will come and fetch you, those who remain, um, to, tomorrow which, uh, thinking about it, was a warning, probably, get away for next night or something. So we went away, and um, that is indeliable. I mean, uh, I, um, um, uh, we were all assembled in, a, in, a, in one of the rooms, and uh, we were the, you know, very small children. Each of us was... Uh, Court and, and uh, each, uh, the older children, now I was one of the older, 
uh, the oldest. Uh, I was nine and a half, and I had uh, I was responsible for what was I think three, four, or five. I don't know, don't remember with running nose and so on. Uh, a woman entered the room. Uh, one of the workers, uh, one of the Jewish uh, uh, women uh, working with us, and and fell to the floor. Uh, I don't know. Either she fainted out of it, seeing these mm -hmm. children, or she got a heart attack or something like that. But I, I remember this moment of her falling when she opened the door, saw us, and boom. Um, it was really symbolic. In any case, we walked to the forest nearby slept there, um, came back, and somebody was had been uh, found the house where my parents still lived, where we lived. Not them, because we had no phone, but the house. And uh, somebody came, Mrs. Frankel, actually, uh, uh, who could travel, being an Aryan, uh, um, came to fetch me, and back I was in Leri de Bain. Uh, then my parents, in desperation really, with the help of one of my father's students of German, a French uh, a lady who took care of me indirectly all the time, then after that, uh, Madame Massé de Lépinay um, uh, uh, got in touch with a Catholic seminary, and uh, a priest uh, came. Uh, took me and I was then, uh, I entered that place in Montluçon nearby, somewhat larger city. Um, and, uh, and then uh, came the last, uh, in a way, the last sequence of our life together. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, this place, I mean, was for me a horror, not that I mean, I was safe there, but I got so sick, so hope sick of to see my parents and sick of the food which I ate or whatever or I thought I was that I <laughs> the the following day everybody was put on diet because I was the only one rushing to the to the loo. But uh, the, I, I went so many times that the feeling was that everybody was ill. Uh, in any case, I fled the place. I, I stood by the main door, the main gate, uh, by the street, uh, and I um, I waited until until uh, those uh, walking around were for a moment away. Was on the street. And I found, I, I knew probably that my parents were in the hospital in that city. They were hiding there under, but the mysterious thing to this day uh, is uh, how did I find them, by what name? Because they could not have been under their name. This would have been, you know, according the police practically. But how I knew the name, uh, I don't know, but I probably had heard the name which they had taken, probably heard it before I left or whatever, or uh, I don't know, but I found them. I asked and I was directed to a room where, uh, where they were. My father was indeed very ill with the ulcer and uh, my mother was pretending some illness, I forgot what, but the, the physicians knew that this was to hide and not uh, that my father was ill, but that my mother was there with him and both were hiding. And then um, they had no choice. I mean, uh, this last scene is, uh, is uh, the thing I would certainly... Uh, uh, as long as I live, this is something not that I won't forget. But in any case, uh, uh, my uh, uh, 
parents uh, called the seminary. And the uh, two nuns came this time and uh, took me by force, practically, because I tried to, to um, not, I mean, I held the bed, but uh, I was uh, not yet 10. And, um, and um, uh, that's how we separated. Uh, what happened to them, I know, they tried to get to, over the border to Switzerland. The irony is that the Swiss, uh, I have the Swiss documents now, uh, the Swiss uh, arrested a whole group of 15, 13 or 15 Jews crossing uh, the border. Um, and uh, um, from the protocol, it's written that those couples with small children would be left to get into Switzerland. Those without children would be sent back, my parents. Some, had I been there, we would have gone through because there was a, a week or two weeks, I, I forgot now, where the Swiss let family, uh, families with children, with small children, enter the country. Uh, otherwise, the, 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 the border was closed, uh, absolutely, the police and army. Uh, and uh, political prisoners were left, were let in, uh, political refugees were let in, uh, but it was indicated the Jews are not to be considered as political uh, refugees. So they were generally sent back, but during that period, families with small children were uh, let in, and it was written in the report of the police about this arrestation, that as uh, the Friedlanders and another couple had no child with them, they were to be delivered to the French police, which they were, and then sent to Rivesalt and to Drancy and to Auschwitz. Uh, I mean, they are on the list of uh, the uh, transport of November 18, I think. Uh, 42 to Auschwitz. Uh, my father died almost immediately. I had, the Germans registered his name and my mother disappeared. Uh, she was strong and uh, younger and she probably was sent to, to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to hard labor and when she died, uh, usually it took a few months or a few weeks. Uh, so that, uh, that was the end of, of that part of my life. And uh, you asked me about my life with my parents. There were several different phases. And then you were in the convent. Yeah. Then I was for... Uh, uh, my father had agreed that I would be baptized in a letter which I have. Uh, that I would, and the demand was also to which he agreed that uh, I would be then uh, educated and kept Catholic after the war, which he agreed and signed. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't have been taken in. That was the condition. And uh, so it's a formal letter. I agree to the demand that my son be baptized. And, and he demanded that I would be sent for a while to another place, somewhere else. He says there his, his child's soul, son âme enfantine, a uh, beaucoup souffert, suffered a lot. So please take him to a more rural environment where he will, which happened immediately because also he was afraid that, the, that on the lists of the police we were three, right, my parents and myself. And, uh, and they did come, but not immediately. They came a year or two later asking where the child was. But um, by then nobody knew. Uh, they went in the rear around to ask, and they even asked, is Madame de Lépinay? She said, uh, no idea. And so um, I was sent to another home uh, in, in the 
Creuse, or in the Andre, which is a very rural department. And there I uh, tried, <laughs> uh, there I got um, a letter from my parents for my 10th birthday. Uh, and even I, with my uh, childish eyes, could see that the letter had been written before. Uh, because they didn't say anything. Uh, manifestly, this was a letter which they left with Madame de Lepinay or anybody else to be sent to me on my 10th birthday. Uh, I don't have the letter. But uh, it always makes problems for me with birthdays. In any case, uh, I became very, very ill and I, uh, I tried to, in a way, I tried to commit suicide. I had fever, and I went, I walked for a while in glacial water, uh, a small stream, uh, as we were uh, on a uh, promenade. Uh, I stayed behind and entered the stream so that I would end my fever, really, and I got uh, diphtheria uh, and was really ill for, for weeks on end and then uh, recovered at that age uh, one recovers uh, with some relative ease and uh, became another person Catholic uh, and all that went on I was very uh, very Catholic I believed I Prayed. I, I had thoughts about my bad thoughts and uh, confessed uh, and so on and so forth. I, I was a, a, a altar boy. Uh, all what uh, I walked, uh, I served uh, the mass every few days. I was altar boy and so on, and uh, I was. Had it continued uh, in that framework, I would have become a priest uh, because that's what I felt uh, I wanted to be. But things worked uh, differently um, in the sense that I became very pessimist. That is, uh, 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 this was ultra, ultra right-wing France. Uh, I would say fundamentalist Catholic, but really the most rigid kind of Catholicism, which today practically doesn't exist uh, anywhere. Uh, extraordinary discipline and uh, self-discipline. And, uh, and um, politically pro but to the hilt. And when one of the kids, uh, kids by now 11, 12, um, mentioned uh, something against Pétain when the, the resistance was already fighting the Germans in that city in Montluçon in '44. He was expelled immediately, uh, sent back to his father, whatever. Uh, so, and, and we read at, at you know we there was always reading. Somebody read to the kids when we were eating. And we read uh, daily the diatribes of Philippe Henriot, who was the worst propagandist of the late phase of occupied France. He was, uh, he was a man uh, uh, who was killed by the resistance before the, the end of the occupation because he was so dangerous in a way. He had the talent of a Goebbels. And he was lashed at anything that was defeatist and that the Americans who had landed and uh, uh, the, the Allies and uh, that would be war to the end against Bolshevists, the Jews. Uh, I was reading that aloud to my uh, friends, uh, to my companions there because I was a good reader. And uh, so, you know... Um, and uh, But what is worth mentioning, maybe, to end that part of the story, is that once uh, this, uh, well, once France was liberated, was Paris, August 44, 
ago you came back. Then the looking for Jewish children started. Uh, various organizations, and uh, Madame Frankel, her husband, didn't come back, uh, knew where I was. She had uh, my uncles, I think, who knew it, knew the exact address of that institution, uh, contacted her. Or she w got in touch with a Jewish organization. I, I don't know who got in touch, but in any case, a, a guardian was appointed who hadn't yet seen me, but somebody who would be in charge of me until I went uh, to Sweden or to Palestine. And he came to the place where I was asking, asking for me, uh, and he was told that there was no child of that name. I had another name. I was called Paul Henri Marie Ferland, but uh, they knew, of course, the head uh, nun knew that my name was Friedland. Uh, he came a second time and said, No, no there is nobody like that. So he went to the office of the prefet, which is the, high, the governor, let's say, of the district, you know, of the department, the prefet of the department de l'Allier, indicating that there was a problem here, and the prefet gave a letter that if they didn't deliver me, uh, the police uh, would be asked to, to find me in that place and bring me out. Now, why, you see, I didn't know until very recently, until a few years ago, uh, A, I didn't know when I write, wrote my memoir that there had been this incident. Nobody had told me that the, I had under, let us say, the threat of police, I was finally taken out. I didn't know it. But the question which uh, was in my mind is why didn't, uh, did the institution take it upon itself not to give me up? Of course, they wanted me to be Catholic, to become a priest or whatever, but still they... Uh, that was callous in a way. Well, now I know why. Because uh, somebody found in an archive in France rather recently, three, four years ago, a document which was an instruction from the Holy Office in Rome, but the Holy Office on instructions from Pope Pius XII, giving Instruct, uh, giving orders to the nuncios in all countries liberated or being liberated, that they should uh, uh, tell the bishops, who should tell the organizations, that baptized children whose parents did not come back should not be returned. Even non-baptized children who were in those institutions and whose parents did not come back to take them personally, should not be given back. Um, the others, uh, 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 if the parents came, uh, the children should be returned. So that uh, it was a specific instruction coming from Rome, from the Vatican, uh, that baptized children should not be returned if the parents did not come back, and that was why they tried really to block the, my return to, to a Jewish organization. It's true, it was not my parents, but, and I didn't want necessarily to leave because I had been told that my parents would not come back. How, did, they, how did you come to know about your parents' fate? Well, uh, it's a piecemeal thing, but one day, as I told you, Madame Frankel knew where I was. So she came to, to visit me, and I have a letter describing this sent to, my, to Madame Masset Lepinay, uh, which I sent in my, in a way, childish way of writing, but still, it, it's written in form of a dialogue. I mean, she asked me whether I would like to go 
she didn't know yet that one would try not to give me back. Whereas I would like to uh, to go to to Sweden or to Palestine maybe to join my grandmother was in Sweden and my one uncle or my two uncles were in Palestine. And I said, well, I didn't know. I had no, I didn't say I didn't want, but I said I didn't know that there was a matter of religion, I said. And she said, what? I, I said, I want to, to, of course, keep my religion and uh, do not want. I would go wherever if I could keep my religion. I have the text of the letter. Um, and, um, and I said, I am waiting also for my parents to, to come and fetch me. That was actually my first argument. And she said, but don't you know that your parents will not come back? <laughs> no, I didn't know. So um, I, it was a shock. And uh, I, I was under shock in a way for several, for so, some time in a psychological way. I wept and, I, of course, I was completely out. But uh, that went by. And then came this uh, attempt to get me out, and I, then I, I left and was then with my guardian and then put in another boarding school uh, in a little place, Santa Marmoron. And then the year after that, 40... 748, uh, put to a very good lycée as a border again in Paris, Lycée Henri IV. And uh, I was supposed to, to have, I mean, to go through the exams of the baccalauréat, which is the, which in France at that time was in two parts. Well, even today, I think. First part, uh, would have been for me at the end of, uh, at, in June 48, and the second part would have been then June 49, then I would have been out. I was early in my studies. I was uh, 15 and a half, so I would have finished the whole thing. 16 and a half usually takes to 18, but um, I had been a little bit early. Whatever, uh, I run away from that place. Uh, <laughs> that was my second running away. The one to try to find my parents uh, in the hospital, the second one from my high school in Paris uh, in, uh, in, uh, in early June of 1948. And I joined a group which then uh, was, uh, was taken down to Marseille and so on. And, I went on the ship Altalena and arrived in what was Israel. By since uh, May, I arrived in June. Uh, as a, and that was another part of my life. But by the time you had shed your Catholicism, yeah, completely, <laughs> normally, it evaporated. Uh, in the sense that I was, no, I, I, for a few weeks or months, I don't remember. I went to Mass on my own. I mean, in, uh, uh, there was also a, in saint Amand, I when I could, I left the boarding, uh, I mean, it was a lycée, it was a college, actually, which is, a, it's, a, it's a secondary school. Uh, you have in French, in France, you had college, which were more provincial, mm -hmm. and then the lycée in the larger cities. So in my college, uh, I could go to mass, and I went from time to time. Uh, but it was less and less um, imperative. And uh, there is this uh, abusing, in a way, incident, which uh, shows how, how I still was, uh, in a way, mixed up religiously. Uh, my guardian, who was uh, um, his family, but he particularly, was an ob observant Jew, not an orthodox Jew, but an observant. He, uh, he prayed in the mornings and uh, put on a talit. And, uh, he was an observant Jew. And so 
And in any case, I mean, they invited me, the family, to come to Paris uh, to join them for the Seder, uh, the eve of Passover, right? And uh, that would have been the first Seder, that was the first Seder of my life. At home, we never uh, had uh, any of these uh, holidays. And uh, so I came, and uh, there were other people, I mean, I was the one retrieved from the from the other side, and uh, the seder started well. Uh, I mean, uh, there were the, the, the prayers and the songs, and the story was told, and, and uh, uh, whatever early, I think the the fish, the fish was eaten, and so on, uh, and uh, then came the meat. And I said, uh, I don't eat meat. But um, my little Paul, <laughs> uh, you are, because I was uh, Paul at the time, are you feeling unwell? I said, no, I'm feeling very well, but it's Holy Friday, a good Friday. <laughs> I don't eat meat on Good Friday. <laughs> If a bomb had fallen on the house, the effect wouldn't have been <laughs> more. Uh, <laughs> so, you see, I was mixed up. But then... In your autobiography, you tell the story about the, uh, the, uh, the Jesuit that... Uh, yes. There were people uh, which, who have to be mentioned. Uh, in order to reinforce, in a way, my faith, uh, before I was taken out, uh, the nuns asked me to visit a Jesuit father whom I knew who had come, who was coming regularly to that uh, institution, which was controlled by the Jesuits from far, in a way, from the, cent the Jesuit center in Lyon, was in charge probably of this institute, but so Jesuits came. And one of them uh, was a uh, Father Lorgiola, now I, in my memoir I didn't mention his exact name, uh, Piet Piero, Pietro Lorgiola, he was an Italian. And uh, they asked, they, they sent me to, uh, to Lyon or to Saint-Étienne, now I don't remember where he was at the time, but in any case, to see him and to talk to him, to spend two or three days in his, uh, uh, wherever that uh, they had their center. Uh, and uh, so he, we visited the city uh, and we entered a church and in that church somehow for whatever reason, how our conversation went, he said, uh, because I said, yeah, well, my parents are dead, and uh, I, I vaguely knew. Uh, and he said, but maybe they died in Auschwitz. Uh, I said, Auschwitz, I'd never heard of Auschwitz. And so he said, yes, yes, that's a place where the Germans uh, murdered Jews. And that's how a Jesuit told me about, <laughs> that was my first information about the Shoah, except, of course, what the little I had, I had seen in person uh, as persecution before. Now, he did that, I'm sure, intentionally, to make me at least to, to he knew that I wanted to become a priest and so on, but he wanted me to know something about not only my identity, uh, my basic identity, but also what had happened. Uh, he saw, of course, that I was being pushed in a direction. Whether he agreed that ultimately I should go in that direction or not, I don't know. But I'm sure that he did that out of charity and justice, you know, sense of justice. Before that, you didn't know that you were Jewish. No, no, I knew. Of course, I knew. But I had, I, um, 
I had converted. I had been taken in by uh, the true faith. And I was, uh, no, no, I knew. But that became irrelevant because I then had become a Catholic. Um, and uh, I didn't ever tell to any of the youngsters with me there that I was Jewish. I, I told them, well, I w came from Czechoslovakia, which for them was Central Africa, you know. And uh, so I was a, a, officially, I'd been a pagan before, Payan. Um, <laughs> of course, nobody mentioned Jewish because nobody knew it except the head mistress, uh, the head nun, um, and that would have been very dangerous. Yeah. Is there any positive thing that l that stayed from the Catholic, from your yes. Catholic age? Yes. Yes. Not much, but yes, uh, the aesthetics. <laughs> The aesthetics. Uh, I must say that uh, I am. I'm. I have no uh, artistic uh, talents. Uh, I don't play any instrument. I. Uh, uh, I don't paint. I don't draw. Uh, but I'm very. I think uh, nothing exceptional, but very sensitive to aesthetics. Uh, in various modes of expression and particularly to the atmosphere of uh, the music and the, the, the lights and the, of a great church. I mean, I, and I think I, I, I really found an immense um, uplifting uh, pleasure uh, in the in this Catholic ceremonial and not where we were, that was a small chapel. Somebody played the harmonium. But uh, when we went uh, very regularly to the large church, uh, larger church in the environment nearby, which belonged to that order, where the music played was, uh, I mean, uh, for my ear at that time, extraordinarily beautiful with an organ. Uh, and where there was the whole um, pomp and ceremony of the of the grand mess, which is not the, the small mass, but uh, I really felt a kind of uh, quote unquote ecstasy. Uh, so I think that uh, of course it was it had something to do, I think, with my own psychological state. But I. I loved that uh, communion. And I think that this aesthetic sense, uh, uh, A, I, it was a very positive moment, or these were positive moments. And, uh, and I think something of it remained when I enter one of those grandiose uh, cathedrals in France mainly, or uh, wherever I am, I visit usually. I feel uh, aesthetically uh, it, it, it gives me some feeling of beauty, but uh, that's a very indirect way of. Uh, so that remains as a very clear reminiscence and a very positive one. And I had some good friends there, and one of them uh, I visited much later, and that helped me to start writing. Uh, when memory comes. When you speak of your past, do you re-experience it? Or do you have mem other memories of memories? <laughs> uh, probably memories of memories. Uh, it's not so simple, I'm sure. I, I, I wouldn't be able to, to answer your question in any convincing way to myself even. Um, some, see, I thought I, I did attempt for many, many years to express in writing 
um, to tell about what was my childhood and early, very early adolescence, that is the war period, and before, but mainly the war period and uh, immediate aftermath until my arrival in Israel. And I didn't succeed. I didn't succeed. I wrote things that were, that I, I mean, I always started with a scene which afterwards uh, was somewhere in the course of the narration and then tore the thing to pieces because I f sensed that it didn't, it, it not it, that it was not true as far as I could remember, but it was, I, I was not able to express anything of any significance. And um, nonetheless, I persisted in my project and wrote a whole, when memory comes, it was not the title then, but wrote a manuscript which I sent to my publisher in Paris who had published already Pius the Twelfth and so on. And he answered, um, very interesting, but it's dead, he said. <laughs> I mean, but he was right. I mean, the word was badly chosen, maybe, but uh, what he meant is it's, uh, there is no emotion there. It's completely emotionless. A kind of, uh, it couldn't be published, of course, that way. Then I asked him whether he would agree for my discussing all this in a dialogue. And somebody, and I suggested that Claude Lanzmann, whom I knew from way back, uh, would be my uh, interlocutor, that is, he would ask the questions and I would tell him. And Lanzmann had said yes, he would do it. And but I dropped and the idea. I saw this. And it's a it's an incident of it's a strange incident that finally gave me the the way of writing uh, and writing uh, a non dead text. I had been in touch sporadically with a, 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 a priest, with a, a, how do you say, uh, somebody who was in a, in a cluster. Um, Convent. Yeah. A monk. a monk, thank you very much. I was in touch with a monk who had been with me, was my age, in, uh, in the seminary where I was uh, during the war. He came from a Catholic family, a very simple family from Toulon, uh, from the south of France, and uh, was my age. And uh, uh, Georges Arnaud, the real name. Uh, and somehow he had found my he had found my address, and uh, wrote to me, and uh, I wrote to him, and uh, my idea was I would go and visit him. He was in in the um, Trappist order uh, in Cefon Sef in on the Loire River. And we set a meeting, and he was, he was the Trappists don't speak usually, you know, they are uh, a silent order, uh, like the Carmelite and so on. And um, uh, he was authorized by his superior to talk to me uh, when I came on visit. So I went to, to visit him, and uh, uh, we, I spent two days there. Uh, we talked, talked, talked about these years. And when I came back to Geneva, where, from where I had come there, I was teaching in Geneva at that moment of the year, I 
somehow realized that I hadn't ever explained to him in these endless conversations, which touched on many topics of our life then, actually how I got there. I mean, yes, vaguely, but so I decided I must make this clear. If we already have spent so much time discussing all this, I must. And I started writing to him. It would have started my dear Georges, right? Mon cher Georges. And, uh, and I wrote quite a long beginning of a letter. And I realized suddenly that as I was addressing somebody who, in a way, was my own childhood, you know, or at least my uh, childhood of the occupied France and the, the, the seminary. As I was talking to somebody, it came out. And then I, con I it, uh, it wasn't a letter anymore. I continued writing, then changed a few things. That is the beginning. I was born in Prague and so on. Uh, but uh, actually, I started writing very easily, and um, and with that, the book was on its way. So I needed something of a human contact, but not anyone. I could have written a letter to my eldest son or to my wife, or uh, but no, no, I had to speak to somebody of my time who had lived in the same place. So w is that a memory of memory, or is that the coming back of an emotion created by a human contact? I couldn't tell you, but manifestly, until I found by pure chance this contact, or rediscovered it by my visit, I was blocked. The moment I started writing to Georges about the past, the past I hadn't discussed with him, uh, the f in a way the gates opened. Uh, so it's a, it's a mix of necessary emotional rev reviving, maybe the reviving the time at the seminary and not the previous. I, I was then writing something else to him, but I needed this, this re-experiencing, probably, of the time in Montluçon, in the seminary, in order to be able to open uh, the whole uh, thing to, a, to an emotionally, yes, emotionally alive story. You then send it, you send it to him before it was published? No. Has he ever read no. the book? Um, Have you sent him the book? Yes, I'm sure I did. He left afterwards. The, he uh, left the order? He left the order. This is a very tragic story, um, which I may mention, because that's a long, long time ago, and he told me in the conversation that he didn't believe in God anymore. And so I said, and George, here you are, a Trappist monk, and uh, condemned to silence, actually, <laughs> living in the trap, which is very strict, and uh, not believing in God. This is the worst thing I can imagine. And he said, well, what can I do outside? He was my age, so at that time, 78, uh, uh, 77, 76, 77. I was, um, what, 32 to, uh, uh, in my 40s. Uh, so he was close to 50. And um, he uh, had suffered, he was very heavy and he had suffered a heart attack, he told me. And so what? who would want to, to, to give him work? I mean, he said, I learned theology. <laughs> and uh, what would I do going away from here? And uh, 
So he remained for a while and then he left. And I think his life wasn't good after that. But you lost touch again. Well, I heard of him, but I lost touch. 